thanks for having me, everybody. Um, I, I live in Baltimore, but I, I come here all the time. I'm here usually every two or three weeks so I can be with the people. Um, so the reason why you, I'm gonna, I, I wanna kind of do a little prologue. Like, there's a really good reason why I'm talking about this at a Rails meetup because I think this technology works really well particularly well with Ruby on Rails. You don't have to use it. You can plug it into whatever server you want, but it's a real sweet spot to connect to both because Rails is influenced from for So this is gonna be really applicable to you whether you care about JavaScript frameworks or not. All right, so how many people have heard of the Uncanny Valley before? All right, well, um, I'm gonna sort of summarize it. This comes from, from robotics, and it's a theory which you can't prove, and some people disagree with, it doesn't matter. Take it on faith for the sake of argument. As things become more lifelike, for a while we we have a greater affinity for them. We have more empathy. Um, we sort of appreciate them more up to a certain point, and then it just starts to get a little creepy. Like somebody probably was like a video of the anim animated face, and somebody made like you just look at it, and of course it's much more lifelike than a humanoid robot. Or but it's just kind of more revolting to you. Like you never people give friendly names to these kinds of robots. You wouldn't, that thing is just uh, creepy. Uh, up to a certain point, um, of course, then things can get really bad. You know, but up to a certain point, then, if it starts to get really indistinguishable from the real thing, then we start to we restore our, our faith in it. So there are some people who think that um, Rails, that web applications, the kind that, that we've been building for the last several years with Rails and using Ajax and techniques and Web 2.0 uh, techniques, are getting to this point where, um, especially because of things like the things that Google does, people really are expecting web web applications to work more like desktop apps. Um, people have less of a tolerance for installing plugins. You know, they just they want to be able to do more and more things. And certainly, we see that with you know with our users. Um, so I would and so um, what I want to talk about is. How can you build, what's one way to build a web application that is going to be the future that's going to catapult you over this gap? I would say the thing that I made, the original version of a box that, that Josh and I programmed is like pr probably like right about there. Like it was, there was so much, there was the functionality was there, um, but I had, it just, it was, it was annoying. Like it, it, the, the way it worked, this is not desktop like enough. Uh, our product has to do with email, and so like the, the more we, we looked like email, we got a, was good up to a certain point, but then it just became very unusable because the techniques of, of Web 2.0 really started to break down. I'm gonna explain that. So what do I mean by 3F? I'm talking about the future of web applications. Um, a, a lot of this introductory material, by the way, it, it comes from, like, uh, I'm borrowing from Charles Jolie, the inventor of Sprout Court. Um, so th like this 3F term is his coinage. Uh, the future of web apps is gonna be fast, fluid, and feature rich. Um, it's gonna be less about the web, more about the application. I just mean that the, for a lot of the kinds of things that, you, that our users are gonna wanna do, uh, you're, you're gonna wanna give more power to the client and not have the client have to rely so much on the server <coughs> for everything. Whereas out of the box, the way you build a Rails app, it really, the web, it's just this, dead web page that has to consult the server for everything. And you kind of reanimate the web page uh, using RGS or JavaScript or what, what have you. Um, but I mean, I can tell you from personal experience, trying to make something that was 3F using those techniques, I really maxed out what I could do. Um, it's, the user should be more demanding. I kind of touched on that already. Um, and it's probably not going to involve a lot of use of plugins. Uh, there's definitely some things that you can only do if you have a Java applet or if you have Flash or something like that. But for the most part, people are not gonna wanna have to configure anything to use your platform. And they're gonna be using whatever browser they happen to have, they're not gonna go out of their way to do anything for you. Uh, and I think a lot of what I'm saying, what I think and other people think, is leading us to the conclusion that client-server actually is back in vogue now because people have better hardware, Smarter browsers, more standards compliant browsers, and you know better bandwidth. So you can do this much more easily than you could three or four years ago. All right, so 
title of my talk is Building 3F Apps with Sprout Core. I'm Mike Zabelski from Other Inbox. I also am one of the organizers of Big Night Baltimore. Uh, I definitely want to give you a caveat at the beginning. Uh, to the man with the hammer, all the world looks like a nail. You may, you may have heard that saying before. So I'm very much in that zone where it's like, whoa, every app should be written with Sprout Core. It's so awesome, but it's not true. I've only built the one thing for Rails, or the one thing that talks to our Rails application. Um, I think I'm probably a good person to be talking about it because I'm still relatively naive. Um, and so I, I really remember what was hard for me to learn about it, but there's a lot I don't know, and there's, not, there's a lot of things that aren't really well documented that only the inventors of it know. Um, but, you know, some of the things I've said about 3F may not apply to every single thing that you're building. But if you're building anything where the idea of real richness, of the user being able to drag and drop things, really customize it, if, that's, if that sounds like a problem you're interested in solving, this is something you should definitely pay attention to. Um, and the core idea I want to talk about is uh, use Sprout Core to build web clients that <coughs> feel just like desktop applications. So they, you know, you can download a few static cached assets that's the entirety of your program, one JavaScript file, one HTML file, one style sheet. And now you've got something that's completely independent and can run inside the browser and just consults the server using a, a lightweight API. Um, you can use whatever you like to build the server. It can be a PHP, Rails, you know, IIS, wh whatever, you know, whatever floats your boat. Um, this is a really common point of confusion. It's not a competitor or replacement of jQuery prototype or, or any other library. Um, it's, in fact, you, the current version of Sprocore uses prototype for some things, and the new version of it will be completely independent of any library. You can use all of those. It's like apples and oranges. If you are looking for a comparison point, this would be more like Open Laszlo or Cappuccino or one of, you know, what's the, like the, there's a couple of ones that are escaping me right now. I just want to definitely emphasize it's not a competitor for <laughs> replacement of jQuery or prototype. So this is, you know, you could use one of those things to make your own framework that works like this. Maybe that's the best way to explain it. So why, let's talk a little bit more about this. Why, why would you build an app this way? What's wrong? You know, we can get pretty far doing what we, we've been doing. Well, it's because, for us, the only reason that we went and adopted this kind of new cutting edge technology is because our users want more. So that's really the ultimate thing that should drive any of these kinds of decisions. So for us, our product, and I'm not gonna pitch on our product, but it has to do with email, and our users um, are, you know, we're not trying to replace your mail client at all. We, we, we are an augmentation to what you're already doing. But the fact is like you spend all your time in mail app, or Gmail, or Thunderbird, or, um, or Outlook, like we have to be pretty close to that, otherwise we're going to be we're going to be in that valley where it's just like it's so annoyingly alien to you. You're seeing your messages in there, but you can't move them around as fluidly as you can here. It sucks. Um, you know, we have it, it, it's bad. So we we have to be we have to feel as much like this as we possibly can. So this summer, Apple released Mobile Me, which is how we became aware of Sproutport because they built it all using Sproutport and these apps. You know, there may be other problems with mobile me, but this part of it was pretty impressive because these work really well, pretty close to the way the native OS X applications feel. Um, this is, and in fact, there's a mobile me mail client. Uh, so I assert that it's impossible to build something like mobile me using traditional Web 2.0 techniques. Like one way or the other, you're going to end up inventing, re you know, reinventing a lot of the technology that's all, all the thought that's gone into building desktop applications. So what do I mean by that? I want to show you something that just like tears the hole in my mortal soul. Um, you know, this is really awful, like really hastily written code, but this is like what a really early version of our app looked like. And it, you know, it probably started off like, th this removed message code, it probably started off with just the, these two lines here, but then we just needed to keep adding things, all this, you know, we need to maintain state. Okay, well, if I remove the message, uh, I need to make sure it gets removed from the, uh, you know, from the browser, and I need to, wherever I'm keeping track of it internally, I need to delete that object. And, uh, you know, I, I gotta make sure I decrement the number of unread messages. I, you gotta, all this stuff that's just very, you're very likely to make mistakes. And, and there are, you know, I would say the number one, one of the number one bugs we had 
had to do with like, oh, it says I have 10 messages, but I only have 12, I have 12 or eight, or it says I have negative one message. I was like, I never could track all those down. Uh, you know, the, and the problem is, like I said, all you're doing in that technique is you're just animating dead parts of a page. You know, that, and you, that requires a lot of extra work. The server is authoritative about everything and is sending you little different pieces. This is an IBM 3270 terminal. Do you know what the big innovation with this terminal was? Because it allowed you to connect to a mainframe and the mainframe could update parts of your screen. So really nothing new at all ever gets done. I mean, this was like Ajax in 1980. Um, and the, the, so the real, what am I really talking about? I'm talking about glue code, which it sucks. Writing glue code is where all the bugs are. It's the bane of my existence. There's still a little bit of glue code in the version of the app that we have running right now in production. And I just finished all these changes that remove all of it. So now we have a completely properly written Sprout Core app. And it's going to fix a whole class of bugs having to do with things like, well, it says I've got five messages, but I only have four. So am I missing one? I don't know. So I still had to use a little bit of glue code due to my unsophisticated approach, which I've since fixed. All right. So that's why I think you need, you know, so to make something that's fast, fluid, and feature rich, I think you need client server. Because now you can have a controller in your Rails app that's about as simple as this. I just pass in the parameters that you for what data you've asked for. We have a refresher that creates a, a hash, turns into JSON, and it looks something like this. I, I couldn't figure out how to make this more readable, but this is like our core technology right here. Every time you make a request to the server, we just return a list of changed, created, or deleted objects. And that's how we keep the client in sync with the server. And you can have multiple different clients connecting. Um, they, they all keep, they're all kept in sync because we also return timestamps, which I, I didn't put in here. Does that make sense so far, what I'm talking about? So this actually, cool thing about this, now you don't even have to use Sprout Core. We had one of our users build, an, well, we have it, he put screenshots up, but he claims to have built a G1 Android app using our API, just from sniffing it, looking at Firebug. So that's pretty, that's sort of a, tangential benefit. Uh, the, the client code is much more straightforward. This is really, you can tell exactly what I'm doing here. If I want to remove messages, I just go to the store, sort of, you can think of this as like the client side database that Sprout Core gives you, which we can talk about later. You know, I want to just destroy some messages, I just tell, it, tell the, the local store to get rid of them. That's it, no glue code. When you delete the messages here, if you've configured everything properly, They'll get removed from the display, and the, you know they the won't be referenced again. They won't hang around to use up memory, and so on. Um, I'll, I'll show you more examples of code, but this is like an early preview of what the actual code looks like. And this uh, execute AJAX is just a wrapper that I've made around um, prototypes AJAX requests because there's some things that I want to do every single time we talk to the server. Uh, like if it's other than if it hits anything besides a get, if it's a non-identified request, I want to add the authenticity token to it. It's just like all that kind of housekeeping stuff. Uh, we also have a heavily instrumented app, and so every AJAX request that goes out, I want to measure the time that we fired it, the time that we got a response back, that kind of stuff. So before you were making your, you had a dead web page, a dead collection of DOM elements, and you were using JavaScript to reanimate it, <laughs> essentially. I, you know, that's how it feels to me in retrospect. I look at the way the version one that, that we wrote compared to the way our Sprout Core app works. It's like, this, this is what it feels like. Uh, now, you're making something that's really alive, building it from the ground up with web native technologies, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, and, you know, we don't use Flash, but I can see you, you know, if we want you, if we want to make you have a really awesome attachment uploading, you know, we, we could do it, get a boost from Flash or Java or something like that. So, Building a 3F application means you need to think like a desktop developer, and this is very difficult for me to overcome, and I thought, I felt very comfortable with my JavaScript skills, and I thought, oh, I already wrote this once, it should be pretty easy, but it's, it feels really, really different to build a desktop app this way, where the client is responsible for rendering all the HTML, the server doesn't do anything except return those JSON strings. So just give me a quick example, um, this is a, fragment of one of our screens, uh, and this is a bane of my existence. This, is still, this still exists. It's because some of the mailbox names 
are extra long, and this is not a fixed width font. So there's no easy way for me to just truncate names. I mean, there is a way around this, just, you know, like all the stuff you guys are working on. Is, it, is that more important than something else? I don't know, but it pains me to no end to see this. Um, another thing, like the scroll bars that, like, the amount of work that has to go into making scroll bars appear on an app like this properly is kind of insane. And, well, you know, but it's much less insane when you're using something like Threadcore. This is such an important point to me that I even put, put this, co this quote in here. I love this quote. Writing an app in JavaScript on the web is akin to writing C on the desktop. It's just one level above bare metal. Um, so the reason, that's why you employ a framework. Sproutcore does 80% of the work for this kind of app for you. So you spend more of your time working on your domain and less of your time trying to figure out how to make the scroll bar work. You know, and then there's just always going to be things like the stupid over overlapping uh, mailbox name thing that you have to solve for yourself. So it actually feels a, a bit, a lot like working on Rails. Um, the ideas of convention over configuration. <coughs> There's, there's generators that put everything in the same directory. I can look at anybody's app project and know exactly where things are. Um, it really has that feel like I'm just taking pre-built components or my own custom components. I'm just attaching them to each other. It's really, that part is very joyful. Oh, I talked ahead of myself. Configuring components, right? Um, in fact, it even uses the build tools, use Ruby helpers and herb, or, or they just added Haml in the, one of the last releases. Except it's also totally different, as I alluded to. For one thing, uh, the ideas for Forceproper come from Cocoa, which is like a 20-year-old framework for building desktop apps on the Mac. Uh, there's things that I did not ever encounter before in the world of web programming, like key value observations, and binding, and some of the other concepts that I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's much more functionally oriented. Really try hard not to keep any state in the system at all. I mean, there's just a store of objects, and then everything else is happening through observers and notifications and key value observations, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, everything's a binding. Like in, in this app, <coughs> really, in these apps, you almost never are calling a method on another object. Usually, you're just saying, "I want to pay attention to the unread state of this message. And when it changes, <coughs> let me know because I'm going to take some action." Like, I'm never directly querying the state of an object. Uh, also, like, you end up running code that's much more defensive and unconfident about what these different condition components are returning to you because, like, when you're, when you're loading our start page, um, some of the things that you're asking for may not exist yet. You may not have been told what list of folders to create. So you can't necessarily assume that there's going to be a, a folder. Um, you know, the, the idea of dry code just doesn't apply here as much because of the lack of state and not wanting to invoke methods. Um, so it, you just end up, it's much easier to repeat yourself than to try and completely refactor things um, so that they look cool but are harder to understand. Uh, here's something else. You may not know, but JavaScript is an awesome language. It has some problems with the implementation that, but as long as you just forget that those things exist and you know there's a handful of tricks that you have to employ to, to save yourself from getting bit. Um, it's, it's actually great. In fact, there's a book called JavaScript, The Good Parts, which uh, is one of my favorite technical books. Um, it does use the same word, model view controller, that you use in your Rails app. They work a little bit different. So that's going to seem really cool and familiar to you, but uh, that, that sort of, that's only going to help you so much. So. Um, you, like the first couple times I gave this talk, that's where I would end it, but I realized like, you still, it sounds cool in theory, but can, we need to get some visceral sense of what it actually looks like. So uh, here's, what ha here's how you bring a new uh, Sprout Core app to life. Just use the generator, SC in, init. Oh, that's actually, can everybody see that pretty well? I mean, it, it's just like typing Rails in the project. It creates all the directories, um, that, that you could want. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about all these things, um, the ones that are mainly important to